General Kaczynski also served in major operations, including Operations Southern Watch, Allied Force, Enduring Freedom, Iraqi Freedom, and United Relief. And prior to his current position, the general was Deputy Commander of the 5th Air Force and Director of Joint Air Component Coordination Element, Japan, at Yokota Air Force Base. Please join me in a warm welcome to General Kaczynski and his panel. Leo, over to you, sir. I think we may have to go up there. Let's see if they tell us to walk up there. All right. So I'd ask all our panel members to please come up and join me. So as they're, they're making their way to the, the stage here, I, just an opportunity again to thank the, the leadership here from Admiral Brown, Chairman Dietrich, General Lanovos, the whole distinguished group of panelists, which are uh, members here, and, and the entire audience out here. So, uh, please, I'll, I'll just talk briefly from here, and then I'll join you over there. So, um, I'll, I'll share. So, I, again, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I will tell you, I've been at the Pentagon in my current position about 15 months, and you can imagine, all of you know everything that's been going on in you know, those 15 months and even prior to that. So. A great opportunity to be able to leave the building here for a little bit to, to join you here today. But I, I shared a conversation earlier this week on Monday with General C.Q. Brown, or the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and it was an opportunity to spend about an hour with him and a deep dive about what we do in the J-4, but more broadly, the Joint Logistics Enterprise. Very interested, you know, he was in our discussion about we're from the joint staff, from you know, his, as we're serving as his director for logistics, where are our touch points, where are our influence, where are our relationships, how that, you know, throughout the joint logistics enterprise to include allies and partners. And I'll share one of the first examples I gave was NDTA, it was our allies and partners who are represented, you know, very much here on the, on the stage today and how important that is. Uh, so I, I just share how important <coughs> in particular with this panel. And so what I'd like to do, I won't be too long-winded here because we've got some great presentations and I think really some great discussion because there's nothing more important. And it goes with the theme of, of how we're leveraging and how we're building on with allies and partners to do anything we need to do. If you look in you know, recent or long history of the United States of America, there's nothing that we have done on any great scale or scope that has been without allies and partners. And with allies and partners, that's broadly with allies, broadly with partners, and that partnership is really the commercial industry, the defense industrial base, many of you who are represented today. And I'd argue right now, what I've seen firsthand in my 15 months during the job and going forward, there's nothing we can do and we should even consider doing without leveraging and, and having that, th those deep discussions with our allies and partners. And part of that's that common understanding. And we'll, you know, when I get to the introductions here, I think all of the organizations that are represented here are all very, important in this very diverse ecosystem of this joint logistics enterprise. And while there's many out there, I think understanding their unique role will be helpful and then you know, set the, a baseline of knowledge for the, for the discussion coming, coming forward. So I, I tell this is um, probably a, a very simple, everyone, a, a statement, but it, it is a very interesting time to be a logis logistician, you know, currently, and, and to be in the logistics business, uh, as you can imagine. Collectively, we face strategic competition from organizations determined to globally undermine and dis disrupt the international order. You know, very much, on the left of as what you were alluding to and discussing in, in your, your, your presentation. So nations and organizations we represent face disruptions from rogue states, terrorist organizations, climate change, supply chain shortages, and global pandemics. And you would think something like this would be theoretical, but I think all of those things I've talked about are all things we've all experienced, unfortunately, firsthand, uh, and, and seeing that, that scale and scope of those disruptions. Further, the character of war is changing. Now, if you've, you may, some of you may be familiar, familiar with the joint concept, uh, you know, uh, war fighting concept, and a lot of things from previous Chairman General Milley had, you know, under his watch had, had built, and then we're kind of continuing to push forward under General Brown, but. The character of war now is has proliferation of technologies such as drones and artificial intelligence, hypersonic munitions, additive manufacturing, the potential for complex rapid escalation with any instrument of power in any domain is daunting. Lawfare, gray zone activities, transboundary challenges, and membership increasing in NATO, the social demographic changes, economic behavioral trends, all those 
in particular of, of today's and tomorrow's workforce, add complexity to this emerging environment. Th just the sheer amount and velocity of change demands our attention toward our collective defense. Uh, one of the roles I serve on the Joint Staff J4 is to work in uh, representing the, you know, along with OSC on, uh, for the NATO Logistics Committee. And this has been an, kind of an ongoing discussion with NATO that you have collective defense, of course, and we have collective defense with allies and partners. But for quite some time, the, there was collective defense, but nations support their own logistics. You know, or you can't do collective defense without collective logistics. And that is an ongoing effort, I think, that NATO and we'll, we'll discuss some of that today with our experts, but it uh, kind of goes without saying, but when, when you don't have that mindset over the last you know, several decades, how to change and to be able to, to have that. So, so today, as I mentioned, we were very um, you know, honored to be, able, be here, and I think we were privileged to have a very distinguished panel here with diverse experiences, and, and uh, their, in particular with their current vantage point. It's a multinational panel, a whole of government panel with unique, unique views on our emerging and globally contested logistics environment. And so, in particular, you know, all of, we've asked all of them in their briefs to, to explain their organization. While many of you might know some of it, but I think for, for the whole, it's very important because it's all, all of what they do, and there's more organizations out there, but have a critical role in this collective defense and the collective logistics, have a critical role with allies and partners and how we leverage that. So first on our panel, uh, I'm privileged to, to introduce Lieutenant General Alexander Solfrin, who I've had the opportunity to know for a few years now. I remember meeting him, in one of the first things I did in my job in the J4, I saw that a, a, an office call with a Lieutenant General from an organization called JSEC, and we'll, he'll explain that he is the current commander of the Joint Support and Enabling Command, located in, uh, it's a NATO command, located in Elm, Germany. And he's been the commander there since March 17th, 2022. But honestly speaking, I did not know about this organization when I had the office call. So I looked through their brochure and background and was amazed at what this organization is designed to do and its aspirations to do that. And uh, you know, based on our discussions and building that, relationships with transcoms and others, how we can build that capability. And as I said, you know, in NATO, that collective logistics wasn't a concept that was practiced, but is, is, is now. And with the General Solfrank, you know, who's been serving his country in the NATO alliance you know, since 1986, commanded on all different echelons, to, from all the way up to his current command, commander of Special Operations Forces Command at the brigade and um, platoon and company level. Also time in serving in Afghanistan, the Balkans, Kosovo, and back in Somalia in 93-94. So uh, just an incredible skill set in an incredible organization that I look very much forward to his presentation. Uh, next is uh, Mr. Alan Gorowicz from, he's a senior executive service member and a strategic advisor at the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, DSCA, which maybe some of you are familiar with or not, but they are one of those other organizations that play a critical role in what we are doing, a critical role in, in our support for Ukraine, a critical role with allies and partners. And so he'll explain his organization. He's been doing this work for over 20 years for the Department of Defense. Actually started off with the Department of Defense in a, a very nice place in Garmisch at the George Marshall Center there, but you know, very experienced. And I think that insight uh, will be very helpful for the group today and, and look forward to your comments. And finally uh, is Mr. John, John Krems, president of United Cargo under United Airlines, who also has a very, very distinguished career and represents that, that commercial industry uh, experience. He, so at United Cargo, diverse responsibility of all things there for uh, the worldwide operations. Prior to that, vice president at uh, uh, Air France, KLM, Marnier, and, and that, that role, he had responsibilities for North and South America for all of their roles. And, and prior to that, about 27 years in KLM, working from Middle East to Africa, Asia. So you know, someone with that breadth of knowledge around the world, but also that incredible importance of that commercial industry, in particular airlift, which you know, from the joint staff, and you can imagine everything we do around the world is very much appreciated. Now we can leverage that. So 
I, I think without any further ado, and I will like to uh, introduce our, oh, I've already introduced, but our, our first speaker here, Lieutenant General Stoll Frank, but very much look forward to the way the sequence will go. Each one will have their briefings, probably about you know, seven to 10 minutes. And at the end, I'd like to kind of get into questions. I have plenty of prepared questions, but I think after you hear their briefings, after you see that, I think it could be a very rich discussion. I look forward to that. So. Yeah, thank you, Leo, for the kind uh, introduction. Um, General Van Over, Admiral Brown. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really an honor for me and a pleasure uh, to be here today in, in Orlando and uh, participating in, in, this, in this conference. The, the briefing, the short introduction supported by slides um, is intended to, uh, uh, to serve as an appetizer for you. So I step only only very briefly into some issues uh, which are of interest for us as being the Joint Support Enabling Command um, and which might serve as um, yeah, the step-in topic for, for further questions. Um, the JSEC is a pretty new command uh, position in Ulm in the, between uh, Stuttgart and, and, and Munich. Um, it was stood up in uh, 2019. Decisions have been taken much earlier in NATO. The uh, result of the Crimea invasion in 2014 and then through different summits in Wales, Warsaw, and so on. But the, um, the, 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 the starting point for this command was in 2019. And uh, in October 2021, uh, this command um, yeah, uh, showed its uh, operating formal full operating capability. So just in time to be ready um, for 24 February 2022. I took command um, pretty uh, shortly after that. So as you can imagine, also a quick start for myself in, the, in, this, um, in this issue. Yeah, next slide, please. Very briefly, uh, what did NATO decide? What was decided in NATO after the attack? Um, after the attack, NATO reacted swiftly. The nations reacted swiftly. Right now, roughly 40,000 troops, around 140 warplanes, 140 ships are support, uh, subordinate to secure. General Cavoli, as you know, uh, also uh, Commander US UCOM, uh, he is the secure and he has currently this force um, ready in order to deter further Russian aggression. Uh, de deterrence and defense is right now uh, against Russia the main effort of, of NATO. Um, and that has been um, decided in, uh, in Madrid in uh, 2022. And um, therefore all the documents are now focusing on, on this threat. There's another uh, task uh, combined with terrorist groups, but uh, with regards to Russia, for political reasons, it's to these two um, yeah, uh, dangers from outside are to be dealt with, but with regard to Russia, that is the main uh, effort in order to deter and defend um, um, NATO territory. In Vilnius, this year in July, uh, important decisions have been taken. The new command and control structure was decided. Um, Secures AOR strategic plan, the SARS, and various sub-strategic plans for land, for air, for maritime, and other topics, and also for our topic, JSEC, with regard to reinforcement and sustainment, has been agreed by the nations, as well as regional plans. These regional plans have been written by the Joint Forces Command, three existing Joint Forces Commands, and they are responsible stakeholders for their joint operations area. Those three operational plans um, were also accepted by all NATO nations. Um, at this summit, a new NATO force model has also been uh, decided by the respective nations. And um, the, this new force model is referring to a tiered approach in order to counter a Russian aggression. Uh, on a tier one level, um, on the first tiered level, one to 10 days notice to move for a size force of roughly 100,000 troops. 
um, a tier two uh, force is ready roughly 200,000 uh, troops within 30 days. And then uh, additionally, uh, roughly 500,000 troops politically uh, agreed are ready in order to then continue with deterrence and if required, uh, defense. New allies uh, have also been um, discussed and agreed in, in Vilnius, uh, Finland joined NATO and right now um, it is, um, yeah, yeah pos it, it is um, probable uh, that Sweden is uh, also joining, joining NATO. Um, there is one um, uh, decision of a parliament of Turkey uh, to decide on, on this final, um, yeah, uh, that, that uh, Sweden joins NATO. And then one uh, additional nation is uh, the decision in this uh, is also still not uh, ready, but it looks very positive that these political decisions will be taken. Next slide. So what's the uh, operational approach? Um, in the end, it's about winning the first battle, or at least not losing it and definitely winning the last battle. As we have uh, experienced in the Ukraine war, um, the Ukraine uh, forces, they successfully um, denied Russia from taking Kiev, Hostomel, and, and so on, you all know that. But it's still open whether they are in the end finally successful. And that is the same um, very general uh, operational approach which we uh, in, in NATO take into consideration. Um, due to the fact that not every inch of a 4,000 kilometer um, border with Russia can be defended. NATO is very much relying on a concept of reinforcement. So compared to the former Cold War times where troops were along the Iron Curtain uh, positioned in order to defend, the current concept is a different one which is much more relying on a reinforcement of troops in order to be um, in the position to defend the territory wherever um, required. And therefore, the um, JSEC's um, responsibility uh, is now, to, it would, uh, can be, can be um, described. The reinforcement by forces and the sustainment flow, that is part of our responsibility. We coordinate this. And I just presented the tier one, tier two sized force, 100,000 uh, and 200,000 sized troops must be uh, coordinated through uh, the space in a, co in a coordinated, synchronized way so that we are really at the location where required and needed in the time when it is um, necessary. In order to set the theater uh, for this um, hopefully successful reinforcement sustainment, uh, the, the enablement of the theater has to be ensured. Therefore, we use this enablement term as something uh, to describe that um, the preconditions for successful deterrence and for successful de defense are really taken care of. And uh, as Gerald von Oberst yesterday uh, referred to um, the, the quote, um, that we have to act now in order to adapt when it is time for change. That's the same in our approach. We have to enable the theater now in peacetime. Otherwise, it is not ready um, in crisis and conflict. Next. Yeah, this coordination has to be done together uh, with, um, by JSEC in the Secure's AOR depicted uh, here somehow in, in, in blue, um, in time and space, the forces there, uh, together with 32 nations. 31 right now, but Sweden, 32nd nation. Next. Yeah, and those are our focus areas where we uh, currently focus on. That's the preparation of the theater, enablement of the theater, uh, coordinated deployment. So when everyone rushes through Europe, uh, the probability that we con uh, create confusion and, and uh, somehow chaos, uh, and it is not a coordinated approach in order to deter, de defend. Uh, therefore, we see the coordinated deployment as a something as well as a co coordinated sustainment flow as a, an utmost uh, very important requirement 
Collective logistics has been mentioned already. Pre-positioning of stocks, clearly. The standardization of uh, ammunition and spare parts is a, is a huge uh, topic. We see smart multinationality as an approach in order not to multinationalize in a way how we multinationalize operations and, and, and troops in Afghanistan, for example. Yeah, we have to multinationalize, that's one very important strength of NATO, but in a way so that the, sustain, the national sustainment responsibilities can still be fulfilled. Yeah, those are all uh, topics uh, which we could uh, discuss later on. Last. Please. Next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, you might wonder why uh, Albert Einstein is here depicted uh, on this slide. Uh, he's born in Ulm, and we think uh, he can support us in our, in our challenges. And uh, effective, efficient enablement, E3, at, at speed and scale, um, is our, yeah, our slogan. Um, e is equals MC square and therefore I think um, we can use this uh, properly and uh, um, Einstein is also well known for, for his quotes and I looked after uh, a quote this morning and I think that one of his quotes uh, where he said, we can't solve problems by using the si same kind of thinking we used when we created them uh, might be also an opportunity also in order to yeah, to approach our current challenges, which are use, huge, but uh, I think we are also making good progress. I'm ready for your for questions in the in the panel. Looking very much forward to it. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Alan Gorowitz. I'm from Washington D.C. and I'm here to help. <laughs> Wait, thank you to all of our co-hosts here. Um, thank you for the invitation, the opportunity to explore our common challenges and opportunities. I'd like to highlight the DSCA presence here. Yesterday's moderator, three academy sessions, um, uh, shows that our commitment to working uh, with the transportation community, bringing the security cooperation and the transportation community together to explore the opportunities and challenges that are in the future. Before I talk about some of the key themes and have a discussion, I want to give everybody just a baseline of the Defense Security Cooperation Agency and the security cooperation community. So I have a short video that I'd like uh, that will sort of provide a little bit of a background. And with that, please roll the video. Security cooperation is strategically important as a tool of national security and foreign policy. It encompasses all U.S. Department of Defense interactions with foreign defense or security establishments to enhance military-to-military -military cooperation and enable greater interoperability with the United States. Contribute to allied and partner regional security through the development of self-defense and security capabilities. And develop lasting professional relationships between the United States and its allies and foreign partners. Common challenges demand common action. The strength of our activities and programs, combined with the United States' unmatched network of alliances and partnerships, work to provide the maximum effect through deterrence. Security cooperation includes a wide range of activities, including, but not limited to, defense and military engagements, training and education, equipping, exercises, advising, information and intelligence sharing, and arms transfer programs, employing authorities and resources from both the Department of State and the Department of Defense. Our full spectrum approach supports our allies and partners through programs that address not only materiel and related training, but also education and advising on strategy planning and doctrine and institutional support to deliver an integrated set of capabilities the defense security cooperation agency or dsca is the u.s department of defense's lead agency for the development and execution of security cooperation activities or programs dsca has been leading the security cooperation community 
now well over 19,000 people strong worldwide for over 50 years. The security cooperation mission can be complex and involves a number of stakeholders both inside and outside of the U.S. government. Stakeholders within the U.S. government, such as the White House, the Department of State, Department of Defense, and Department of Commerce, play significant roles. The U.S. Congress provides oversight over these activities. Even within the Department of Defense, multiple agencies are involved, ranging from the acquisition community, the military departments, the Defense Technology Security Administration, and implementing agencies. Outside of the U.S. government, key stakeholders include U.S. industry and our allies and foreign partners. It is a continuous, delicate balance to address the many priorities and requirements at play while ensuring the U.S. security cooperation community remains effective, efficient, and transparent throughout a program's life cycle. The largest and most well-known security cooperation program is the Foreign Military Sales Program known as FMS. Authorized by the Arms Export Control Act, FMS is the primary means by which the U.S. government transfers defense articles, services, and training through an agreement and sale to allies and partner nations. The FMS program is overseen by the U.S. Department of State to ensure sales and transfers are made consistent with the foreign policy interests of the United States. Implementation of these activities is administered by the Department of Defense as its allies and partners benefit from its technical and operational expertise, existing procurement infrastructure, and transparent purchasing practices. Through FMS, allies and partners have every confidence that they receive the best systems at a fair price and that they can depend on the integrity of the American system. Strengthening our allies and partners is a key priority for the Department of Defense, and security cooperation is a valuable tool in achieving these objectives. The United States is proud to be the global security cooperation provider of choice, and together we build security through global partnerships. Thank you. Uh, first slide, please. So it's been, many, it's been said many times already that the national defense strategy has put a focus on integrated deterrence, and that puts a premium on our international partnerships. We are stronger because of our international partners, and as you're seeing in Ukraine, we are friends to our partners. And I'd just like to again thank all of our international partners that are here. It's really important that you've joined us today, um, and I appreciate uh, the conversations that we've had. Uh, for our industry partners, you already know the importance of international partnerships in business and in transportation. It's a team sport. The cooperation is built on trust and trust that's built on practice and integrity. And at DSEA, we talk about a values approach to security cooperation. We won't beat our strategic competitors by playing at their level. Our uniquely American approach provides us an asymmetric edge. What we do is encourage and enable allies and partners to play security roles in support of our shared challenges. Uh, as an academy panelist noted yesterday, what we need to do is better communicate with our allies and partners and find out what is it that they can do, what is it that we want them to do, and how can we help them be prepared and have the capabilities and capacity that's necessary. DSEA wants to listen to partners we want to, um, through our activities, um, and we want to assist them. Security cooperation is a policy tool. Exec uh, the next slide, please. Security cooperation is a policy tool executed uh, under guidance by the Departments of Defense and State and with many other players influencing the partnerships. It's a partnership with uh, DOD, partner nations, and industry, each with their own priorities. And at DSEA, what we try to do is manage all of those different, uh, different priorities with a keen focus on what our national security mission is. You'll see the U.S. Transportation Command and the transportation community as key components in the SC community. It's complicated work. Next slide. 
DSCA's workforce, as you saw, um, is just a small part of the larger security cooperation community. We have over 1,000 people at DSCA alone, um, and we're about to grow as the security cooperation offices across the globe come underneath DSCA with the Secretary's new guidance uh, to bring that under a Defense Security Cooperation Service. The broader SC community um, is large and diverse. We provide much of the implementation policy, the expertise, the support, that glue that holds it all together. In the end, it's the people, dedicated, professional, and committed to teamwork that makes it all happen. And I'm so proud of this community right now. All of you here that's, that's been a part of what we've seen in, in Ukraine and now that what we're seeing in Israel. Uh, we must continue to get together and talk about how to cooperate each other. We must talk about the challenges now and prepare and practice. You can't surge trust. I'll close by just mentioning here uh, our outgoing Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Colin Call, noted uh, shortly into the Ukraine conflict that he said, not since 1973, the Yom Kippur War, have we seen so much surge to a country so quickly, and he was just amazed at that. And that was long before we knew what was to come. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jan Krems, as already introduced in a nice way. More than 36 years in the industry, in two companies, and really proud to be part of this community and see with our experience, being a commercial airline, how we can support and help, so that's very important. I plan to give you an inside look at to us what we do at United Cargo and our link to the military world. But let's start with a short video. This is the story of an airline. It begins a century ago. Wait, let's find a better way in. This is the story of an airline, one that's a force for good. And it's got everything. Romance, suspense, setbacks, seatbacks. It's a sci-fi story about a piece of trash that fuels a plane to help protect the planet. It's a rescue story to save a connecting flight told over and over and over again and a coming-of-age story about a little girl who dreamed she could fly, and then did. Trust me, you won't want to put this one down. In fact, you can't, because you're in it. Yes, you, along with thousands of other hero characters, on a mission to do good in the air and beyond, making the world a happier, friendlier, safer, greener, more inclusive, more fascinating place. The end. No, wait, that's not right. This story doesn't have an ending. But that's kind of the point of the story. We're never finished. Because this is the story of an airline when good leads the way. It's working. United Airlines' new ad campaign, Good Leads the Way, is more passenger-driven or more passenger-centric as we are a passenger carrier with a big cargo department. But it also applies to cargo. In fact, I like to say that good leads the way started with cargo. As the world was shutting down in March 2020, United recognized the importance of keeping the supply chain moving and shipping goods, even though lockdowns were happening and our international schedule was reduced to only six destinations. That's when we introduced the freighter-only flights in response to COVID. We continued our support for humanitarian aid and sent supplies, vaccines, and medicines across the globe. We took the lead in the aviation industry with our sustainability initiatives. We invested in the future by making one of the largest aircraft purchases in aviation history. And we continue to show our support to the military with mail supplies of shipments, supplies of shipments, mail shipments, and cooperation where possible and needed. Good leads the way is not only to make more money, but do the right things and to do good in life. 
We were the first airline to launch freight-only flights in March 2020 and immediately started with the flights from the US to Europe. We continue to find new and innovative ways to fill our planes to this day. Even though our passengers have returned, even if the passengers have returned, during the pandemic, we moved more than two billion pounds of cargo on our freighter-only flights and passenger flights. We operated more than 15,000 freighter-only flights. We have 17,000 up till now, but not changing the construction of the flight to make sure that the moment we could fly again, these planes could go back into service. On these flights, we moved more than 800 million pounds of cargo, office supplies, home entertainment, exercise equipment, food, and especially a lot of aid. We moved more than 370 million pounds of medical shipments and more than 2 billion doses of COVID vaccine. We were the first in November to fly the commercial Pfizer shipments from Brussels to, uh, to, uh, to Chicago, and we were very proud of that. United Cargo works with freight forwarders and humanitarian organizations to deliver critical aid to communities in crisis. Examples are oxygen concentrators to India, water and supplies to areas hit by hurricanes, COVID-19 vaccines to vulnerable areas worldwide. Operation Fly for Formula flights donated by United Airlines will contain over 300,000 pounds of approximately 3.7 million eight ounce bottles equivalent of Kendamil infant formula. And we did a lot of dog or animal transfers when there was the hurricane in Puerto Rico. Leading the industry with sustainable action. And we are doing all this with focus on reducing our carbon footprint through sustainability initiatives that will have a global impact. Our United Ventures division launched the Sustainable Flight Fund, investing in many areas, like sustainable aviation fuel. We purchased more stuff than any other airline this year. Carbon capture and sequestration uh, technologies, EV toll, electronic flying taxis to move passengers between city centers and airports in New York, Chicago, and LA. And we hired Oscar de Grouch as our chief trash office and I think he has uh, an amazing hairstyle, so uh, it's good. <laughs> For United Airlines, this is not just a marketing story or a marketing tool. I think it's in our DNA to make sure that we make it a difference in the world. Refleshing our fleet with United Next. We also have been investing in a new fleet with better fuel consumption. From now until 2032, we expect to receive more than 800 new aircrafts. We are adding capacity to existing routes by upsizing our flights. No, I have to go back. It comes. By upsizing our flights, regional jets are upsized to mainline narrow bodies, which feed our ever expanding international wide body flights. Larger planes will allow us to expand our network from our hubs. More passengers, more wide bodies, and what I like, more cargo service and more cargo space. By 2030, 75% of our fleet will be new aircraft. Every third day for the next seven or eight years, we will get a new plane. Every third day. We continue to support the military throughout the pandemic and beyond. Some examples are pre-boarding for all military and United Club access. We are the largest mover of US military mail. Frankfurt is the biggest mail destination. Guam, Marshall Islands, Hawaii, island hopper location are also important places United delivers military shipments. Keeping our military families connected with the goods they need and keeping them connected with loved ones to feel a sense of home is of critical importance. Craft activation, the United commitment is on the slide where you can see what our commitment is in the different phases. Reads across America, remember and honor the fallen soldiers. 
Every year, when there is an activity with REACH uh, across America, we sponsor, we will go there, and we also put the REACH on, on, the, on the grave there. United Military Pilot Program is pretty new, provides secure landing place for participants while they complete their service to the nation. Partnership with Army PACE Program provides American soldiers with an opportunity to prepare for career after service to connect with companies like us. Then we have a business resource group within United called United for Veterans, where we recruit, develop and retain thousands of qualified veterans. And if you see here on the, on the picture, um, servicemen carrying, we were flying a piece of the USS Arizona from Honolulu to uh, Denver, I think it was two months ago. American flag draped uh, around the crate flew December 7, 2022 over Pearl Harbor National Memorial. In Denver, this was taken to the Freedom Memorial in Aurora where it's placed today. As a company that has long supported our military families and veterans, our teams are proud to mobilize to lend a hand. In short, that is what good leads the way for United Cargo. Thank you very much. Okay. <coughs> Just a uh, uh, appreciation again for, I, I think those were all outstanding presentations. I really appreciate the, the, the panel here at least setting the baseline. So you can tell all those are outstanding organizations that represent you know, probably many more you know, outstanding organizations that are part of this ecosystem of this joint logistics enterprise. Uh, you know, for, fortunately, we do have some, you know, pl plenty of time here for questions. What I'd like to do is maybe start the first question here, and then we'll look to, to take things from the audience. And so, uh, obviously, there's technology. There's other pieces that would be interesting to talk about. But you know, we, we do talk a lot about procedural policy change or changes, but less about cultural changes to our institution. So I ask maybe for you know, to consider this, and we can, you know, go through maybe. A, I think it could be a question for everyone. What cultural changes do we need? to incorporate into our institutions to be more agile, resilient, and responsive. And furthermore, I think, to be more inclusive of allies and partners in, in what we do. Sure, happy to start with that. Um, the culture of the US military has typically focused on self-sufficiency. That's what we do. We fight and win America's wars, and we, we don't try to take a lot of risk. And it's taken us a little bit of time to sort of transition into integrated deterrence. Um, we need to rely on allies and partners in ways that we never have before. We need to practice with them. Um, and I think that one of the biggest cultural changes that we need to do is, is maybe not risk averse, we're too risk averse um, when it comes to allies and partners, maybe not might be the right way to, to say it because it is about war and we want to reduce risk. But I think we may want to look at more of the opportunities to reduce risk through redundancy and think about the other ways in which we, we can partner with allies um, and partners out there in ways that we never thought about before. Yeah, yeah with regard to um, cultural changes mindset um, comes to my mind um, that uh, at least with regard to my task in Ulm um, and NATO's task uh, with, with regard to deterrence and, and defense. Um, and that has been achieved uh, after the 24th of February uh, 2022 um, to create a, a common approach, a good cohesion, one, one approach, one coherent, comprehensive approach in order to counter a threat. And I think um, that is very important um, to come from that idea um, that uh, this cohesion also is the center of gravity for um, successful deterrence and defense. And out of this, um, um, with regard to JSEC's task, I see this as really important um, that we create one comprehensive um, picture with regard to movement, with regard to sustainment, with regard to all our um, uh, aims, objectives, intentions, and so on. So that is a, a comprehensive common approach countering um, a threat uh, from, from the East. Um, and by this, then uh, we are, I think, um, capable of uh, creating the conditions um, 
and I argue as the commander JSEC. Uh, so I, 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 I tried to argue from from our challenges which we which we currently face that we are better enabled to really counter um, um, the threats and uh, time requirements and and, and so on. Um, so uh, my plea would would be um, that this comprehensiveness, this cohesion, uh, is the starting point for a lot of actions and a lot of consequences um, which have to be developed. One comment, and maybe from a different angle, is cultural change. For me, being an international company, I learned a lot. We have one strategy, but to involve all the different cultures that we work with around the world and listen to them, get them in, into the decision-making, really helps. What I found being a Dutch person in the US, sometimes it's too much US-centered. And if you're an international or a global company, be careful not to be too much in that area and try to open up. And that's what I learned over the years. And I got the opportunity to work for an American company, but also to see the different cultures you have around the world, how to tackle them, listen to them, get all their feedback in, and then with still the common strategy, as you also say, the common goal, but find out with the different entities, different views, different mindsets to come to, uh, to yeah, making, making the next step. Yeah, that's very, very good advice. I'd, I'm trying not to talk so much about it, but an example that when I did 05 or Squadron Command, which is a command we have about 15 to 18 years in, in the Air Force, I did in a place called Papa Air Base, Hungary. There's a multinational 12 nation every year between which the Netherlands is part of. There's a lot of Eastern European countries, Netherlands, Scandinavian countries, but you know, it was there about 13, 14 years ago when it, it set up. And it was C-17s. I think I was hired maybe because I could fly and instruct in C-17s, but the leadership there was, well, one is the organization itself was about 30% U.S., 70% European. And so when you come in there from the U.S. frame of reference, not that it's bad, we, we know how to fly the plane and fix the plane and do that, but how the organization works is really listening and understanding and realizing it's not a U.S. Air Force organization, it's not a Dutch Air Force organization, it's a multinational organization, which can be better. In the end, you know, our goal was to be the best airlift squadron in the world. And, uh, you know, it's high, but, you know, I think somewhat achievable goals, but we could do that, and I think we were closer to that because of the richness of having 12 nations and all their experience and, and an aspect to that. But it, it does require listening and changing your frame of reference a little bit, learning, educating, like I'm, you know, even though I knew some about your organizations, but from your presentations here, it was, uh, you know, again, I better under, common understanding for that, so thank you. For uh, maybe another United Airlines or commercial airlines question for you, and it, not to bring up the COVID pandemic, but actually I, I think a broader than just the lessons learned for that. So obviously United Cargo manages movements and tracking of time critical air freight, uh, cold chain shipping, medical supplies, and you know, other type of shipments across the, the United States and the world. So the question is what emerging technologies or processes for predicting, processing, tracking, um, this near real-time transit visibility. I mean, that's part of it. The other is, you know, you know, based on the COVID experience in that pandemic, which we hope never happens again, but could for, I mean, it's just another level of contested logistics. What, what, what technologies or others did you learn maybe to? I mean, we learned a lot from COVID, but to get connected, to know exactly where your shipments are, that never changed. There's also for us no difference between domestic and international, because that's important. We have an, an, an organization, a matrix organization, that deals with the different products that we have globally. Uh, all these people are experts close to our customers. Then we have, we call that uh, TC towers, we call that support towers around the world that are very close, the first entrance to our customers to see what is happening. We focus a lot of added value. We focus a lot of pharmaceutical shipments. We need to see where they are. I mean, if it's human remains or it's other shipments, we have to see how it works. Every station has its operational unit and our lines are very short. So yes, you need an IT system that we have that's globally linked, um, where we can see always where the shipments are, but of course so many things go wrong. But then it's, it's the personal interaction that we have that makes the difference close to our customers. 
the fun of cargo is over passage is that, although people say cargo doesn't talk, <laughs> but their owners talk a lot, so uh, um, it's, you can play the pipeline game. We have 5,000 flights a day, they're all open for cargo, and a shipment that flies, for example, from Chicago to Frankfurt can go via Brussels, Amsterdam, London, or whatever, it's, it's just the, the, the throughput time. But to have that connection, to make sure that we have that, that towers connected there with the people, make sure that we always know exactly where the shipment is, and of course we make mistakes, and then try at least to be proactive to our customers to make sure that we have a solution, but at least don't wait too long because that also uh, makes, it, makes it tough. But that's how we play it, and for us domestic or international, there's no, there's no difference. I might, if, if, I have some more prepared questions, but if there's, I'd like to check if there's questions from the audience that I'm welcome to. So this question is coming um, from commercial industry out here in the audience, um, and for anyone on the panel. So sometimes big capabilities come in small packages. So as you're, as you're connecting with your partners, um, are you casting your net wide for those large companies, but also how are you capturing those small companies who can give you some pretty agile capability? Yeah. So I can talk a little bit about that. Um, actually, one of the uh, focus areas we have right now is what is good for the United States military and our mission for us to do our things is not necessarily the capabilities, the technologies, the systems that are best for our allies and partners. Uh, we fight wars differently than uh, our partners and our problems are different. So one of the things that we're doing right now is casting a wider net on what are the opportunities. We're partnering with the Defense Innovation Unit um, and with many of the other parts of the Defense Innovation Ecosystem to say what are the solutions that you may have for allies and partners they may be on the cutting room floor of what you develop for us, the United States military, but they may have it there. And so I would encourage people from industry, if you have solutions um, that, you know, again, may not be right, but because you deal with vendors and technologies and things like that, that you think would be appropriate for allies and partners with very different mission sets. Um, earlier, we, we saw uh, pictures of the Chinese in the Philippines going up. How the Philippines needs to deal with the Chinese right now um, in the gray zone is very, very different than what the U.S. Air Force and the Navy and, and our military are, what they're gearing up for. And so they're different capabilities. Um, so for example, we're partnering with the Joint Intermediate Force Capability Office, the non-lethal folks, they don't like to be called that, but that's what they are. Um, and they have actually solutions that, that they've been looking at, the research and development and working with vendors that uh, the United States military isn't going to buy, they're not going to become U.S. programs of record. So again, I would encourage that the door is open to new and innovative ideas, um, and please bring them in, in service of allies and partners, not just our military. Excellent answer, Tim. Any questions? Yeah, maybe. Uh, can, uh, from, from NATO headquarters perspective, JSEC. Um, well, uh, this uh, techn te technological progress is, is very important, um, and it makes probably also the difference uh, between our approaches and uh, enemies' approaches. Um, with regards to our main uh, challenges, which we currently face, um, is interoperability. Um, in JSEC, uh, we are... Um, working very, very hard to create this common operational picture, so to, to develop a clear understanding of what is really available, who is moving where, why, how, and when, through corridors, um, through uh, road, railway, airways, uh, different approaches um, in order to move uh, huge types of forces. So with regard to this um, uh, challenge which we have, this interoperability uh, is of utmost importance. So whenever there's a technological development, this is to be supported, but um, I would plead for having a clear eye also on connecting others, uh, NATO partners, allies, um, because of uh, our common, uh, common goal in order to deter and de defend uh, 
um, successfully. And um, if there's only one single approach and others not being able to be included in this, um, we as NATO, um, we, we are definitely going to struggle. We're hearing good news about how the NATO model is being used to um, address issues throughout, throughout that uh, theater. Are there any ways that we can expand that model into other theaters, such as the Indo-PACOM area, or are there any efforts ongoing in that regard? I'll take this, if you don't mind, and I don't know if anyone else wants to add. I think going back to the interoperability piece, and actually interoperability, there's, a, which is important, but, you know, in some ways we need interchangeability. In some ways we found, you know, recently with efforts with Ukraine and others, even though there's NATO standards and other things, sometimes things aren't quite exactly the same, and you need them to be, and you need the practice to be. So I think the not that NATO would expand in, in Indo-Pacific or all that, although NATO nations have definitely have a, a significant role there. But that, when it really comes down to that basic of interoperability, of, of common understanding and practices and things, so that what's helpful in the, I think, in the Indo-Pacific is we have many allies out there from the U.S. perspective, just like NATO allies. But if we have a NATO standard and we really adhere to that being interoperable, that equipment or munitions or fuels interchangeable, the process is the same. That's the same within NATO, and U.S. is part of NATO, and NATO works with Japan, and bilaterally we're the same there, and Japan or U.S. works with Republic of Korea, and they're the same, and then with Australia. That, that interoperability piece becomes very important, and, and this is not just for a competition or a conflict. This is for humanitarian assistance, disaster relief. You, know, you land someplace with a bunch of planes and people trying to help, and if all of a sudden, you know, things are in inches instead of centimeters, or just you know, conversion. Just it, how do you get some of those basic things? So that's something we look at a lot. Some I was talking with, uh, you know, with our staff about and the chairman about prepositioning, you know, things around the world and how do we do that? And that needs to be strategically thought about, but inherent should be this interoperability piece. So I think that's that's you know, there's maybe more to it, but I. Uh, and I think that's one of the, the key efforts we're, we're looking at, and you know, DSCA plays a big role in that, just to, in their, uh, you know, across the world. So. Uh, here's a question. Um, there's been a heavy focus on the preparation for war and leveraging allies and partners' capabilities. The question is, is um, when war is not present, is there efforts to, to work together in terms of just a natural order, whether it's in NATO or whether it's around the world, um, in order to leverage those capabilities every day? I think that we had three discussions also yesterday when we had a meeting and discussions on, on, on how cooperation could be better. And we discussed it this morning. The issue sometimes we have discussions when we are, well, let's say, at the far end, while we should have discussions at the beginning. And really, even when it's the most peace time of the year, of the fire, of the, uh, whatever, the century, let's sit down, let's talk with each other and make sure that when shit hits the fan, that we are there to work with each other. And sometimes I have the feeling we start too late in doing that. And I think that should be somewhere we should start. And if it's on a small area or a bigger area, we discussed, we fly, for example, I think almost to every nation in the world. We have a lot of um, entrants at, at government affairs. We have all the companies there, our freight forwarding friends or other people that we know where we could help each other with that knowledge that we have and see if something happens that we know how to start and where to start or at least who to contact at a certain stage. If, if I could say, we exercise a lot our logistics. We're doing that all the time. Um, where we have more opportunity is, is when we get done, is where are our allies and partners um, need something different or what didn't work and feed that. One of the challenges with it is that the J4s of the world run the logistics enterprise and the J5s of the world run the security cooperation enterprise. The demand signal 
for what we want from allies and partners, what they need, because we influence what they invest in um, and the specifics of it. You know, that comes from generally from the J5. And so there's an opportunity for the J4s of the world, the logistics people, to talk to those security cooperation planners and to, and to provide that demand signal so that we in the security cooperation community can learn from your exercises and what you're doing and, and we can influence allies and partners. Ultimately, they buy what they want to buy in some cases. In some cases, we give them things. But we can definitely encourage certain things because um, some of the acquisition folks uh, there are not connected with the people that are doing the actual logistics. It's just sort of the, the problem of bureaucracies. Mm. Um, yeah, with regard to the question, um, what we don't prepare in peacetime, we don't have in crisis. And uh, therefore, we have to use the time now. And um, the second uh, topic uh, in regard to the question is, um, or the, the second um, yeah, consideration is, I think agreeing is not enough. Um, so speaking, discussing, agreeing, yeah, that is very important, sets the basis. Where um, I as Commander uh, JSEC uh, am currently looking on and pressing also is that we use the time now, as Jennifer was also so mentioned. So uh, the implementation of this agreement, that is what we are striving for and we have to strive for. So agreeing, that is easy in discussions and, and uh, we are agreeing upon uh, interoperability and that, that is good. But what is important is really the implementation of this interoperability. And that's the hard piece. Um, and I, I give you an example where we are currently very much looking into this implementation is uh, in Europe reducing the border crossing bureaucracy which is existing. Um, that is natural given uh, somehow due to uh, national sovereignty laws and so on, but um, it is not, not naturally given in a way that it cannot be changed. So we are currently working on this reducing these, um, yeah, these, these boundaries which, uh, which uh, make movements across borders uh, really to a bureaucratic and, and time-consuming challenge. And reducing those um, bureaucracy uh, hurdles is, um, is very important for our, from our point of view because it uh, enhances this fluidity which we are looking for with regard to forced movements. And so implementation of this topic, not starting in crisis, is one example for me um, would I would uh, answer on, 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 on this question um, is where we have to focus more on implementation with cooperation. In an attempt to prioritize development of an effective multinational logistics framework toward assured access capacity and capability, what is the panel's recommended military priority to action today, and what should be prioritized for other elements of national power? Mm. I mean, I, I guess I'll, I'll take that. There's quite a few things on, on the list. But I, I'd say one is, and this is you know very good having someone from the commercial industry who I think you can see yourself very well. That's what how you do well in your business to do that. I think one we have a problem is just being able to see ourselves, that common understanding picture, which is, or common operating picture, which is really based on data and sharing and be able to do that. I think collectively, first, to do that, we have to, you know, to know ourselves. And, and th th those efforts are ongoing. And then it's the relationship, the interoperability piece, and moving forward within the joint staff, in the joint war fighting concept, there's a joint concept for contested logistics, which is based on you know, ways to overcome these challenges. What, an effort that we're working within our joint staff team, which is included with our multinational partners, in particular Five Eye partners from New Zealand, Australia, Canada, UK, is a, and building with NATO as well, is a multinational concept for contested logistics. Not that the concept will be so, concepts will be so different, but it's the perspective of doing this with allies and partners. And not sort of bad, when that joint concept for contested logistics was made, it was made kind of a 
you know, in understanding how important allies and partners, but it was a, a U.S. developed thing with, that we develop and then share with our allies and say, here, this is where you'd be great to do. And they're like, that's nice, but this is how we would do it. So, so I think in, in doing that, we are looking, and, and, that's, and this is an effort here that builds on that multinational piece, but uh, work in progress. So I, I think those are some of the priorities and things that we're, we're actually taking action on. Yeah, with regard to, to our uh, focus, um, this common recognized picture, which uh, Leo, you just mentioned, is very important. We currently build a uh, reinforcement sustainment network, how we call it. So um, that is not only roads, railways, seaways, harbors, and so on, uh, but also this functional layer, these functional um, necessities, which uh, are to be described like those border crossing regulations, contracts, and everything in place. So if um, necessary, we can switch easily from um, into a deterrence, deterrence mode uh, more easily and not with, um, with, with time delay and, and so on. Um, and thirdly, uh, we have to, at least in Europe, we have to get used uh, to um, the assessment that first we have, we might not have the support dominance, uh, at least in a certain stage of, an, of a situation of operation. Secondly, um, our lines of communication, our networks, our infrastructure will be targeted. So this contested environment, what does that really mean? Not only for the forces deployed frontline, but also the strategic base. And what does that really mean with regard to resilience, uh, creating a robust and agile system so that nevertheless um, we as military feel ourselves comfortable with this situation and we can support uh, the forces in a, in a reliable way um, um, in a multinational environment, in a complex multi-domain operational uh, effort, wherever the operational commanders might deem it necessary. So three, three priorities, I would say. A clear picture, RSN, and... Uh, contested logistics, contested environment, and having all the necessary means and on hand in order to successfully support um, the, the fighting wherever and however needed. This question is for Jan. Um, question from the audience. So if we need additional capability, are you able to leverage your allies and partners in the commercial industry, whether it's your Star Alliance, or others to, to grab greater capability and greater capacity? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends on, but in principle, from our side, all willingness, and then to see how the partners, or the JV partners, joint venture partners, or other partners that can support. But I think uh, it's for the good cause, we always say yes, no problem, I think. Gentlemen, what advancements in technology are you looking for to enhance our collective capability to meet global delivery, both in peacetime and in wartime? Maybe I can share from the, from the joint staff. It, 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 a lot of this goes with the data you know, and the, the common operating picture, of course. But we, we often talk in the, in the J4 that we, we need 21st century technology for 21st century problems. And if you go back to you know, certain uh, evacuation operations in Afghanistan or some other things, initially what happens, we, it, crisis like that, it happens. But you wind up going back to you know, drawing boards or chalkboards or Excel spreadsheets and how do we you know, leverage you know, the cutting edge technology to be able to do that. So one is to be able to, to see ourselves and, and be able to have those AI kind of enabled or facilitated decision tools to help senior leaders to be able to visualize where things are, visualize if you had to move things around. That's a, you can imagine the challenge right now. We're supporting, obviously everyone knows with Ukraine, supporting efforts in, in the Middle East, you know, supporting still ongoing efforts that we just normal training and other stuff in the Indo-Pacific, let alone Africa, South America. So that's a lot of airlift, a lot of capacity that's needed. 
and usually just you know, being a mobility pilot and, and being in this business long enough, there's, you know, of course everyone wants to get their stuff as fast as they can. There's just never enough, in particular now. But how do we be able to visualize that, be able to include allies and partners? And, and that partner, I think, is really that commercial capacity. You know, although with Transcom, they're very good with, and, you know, hence this, this partnership here with NDCA, but you know, sometimes in the military or U.S., we just initial reactions, what do we have, what can I do myself? which usually isn't enough, but you start expanding allies, you have partners, commercial aspects, what they could do, and having that real dialogue. So not last minute, hey, can you help us, but bringing but them in early on the planning and to be able to understand capacity. At the front end, yeah. if you have that and know that, that will help a lot. Yeah. I would just note that information technology is only good as the information that are in the databases yeah. that are there. Absolutely. And oftentimes we, we forget that if if we, if our, in, within the Department of Defense or allies and partners aren't putting accurate data into what they have or what they can do um, in there, um, and it's shareable, um, it's all the information technology, machine learning in the world won't make a difference. I would like to support that 100%. Uh, we are currently working on uh, this um, uh, operating picture um, and using LOCFAT, uh, NATO system, functional error system for logistics. We are currently struggling um, because not everyone uses this uh, very baseline um, system. And therefore, this technological progress is um, important, um, but it has a lot to do with, uh, as I also uh, said, um, interoperability, um, that all the data inside the system um, makes a dis difference. And uh, if there are black boxes or areas um, from NATO point of view, where you don't have an idea upon, um, the newest technologies is not of help. So we, I think we need a good baseline and good solid basis. And based on that, then uh, new technology, artificial intelligence supported and so on with regard to uh, better decision making processes and so on, uh, I could imagine that. Uh, but we have to focus on this baseline from NATO perspective, this baseline, common data sharing uh, in order to have this uh, common recognized picture that is of utmost importance. And there we are currently struggling, honestly. Yeah. Okay. We have some t time for more questions or? Okay, okay. To piggyback on that last question, one of the members of the audience mentioned and this is for General Saul Frank, the EU PESCO project. Um, I think what they're referring to is, is how are you creating a framework with such diverse interests in diverse countries across Europe in order to create that, that common goal? Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, as JSEC, we are an operational headquarter, so our focus is on um, yeah, supporting the operational commanders with regard to their plan, their regional plans, which are ready. To, um, to support them that they are executable. So we don't work on the strategic political level. That is not our focus, first thing. Second, yeah, definitely in, in Europe, um, um, the PESCO project, military mobility, is a, is a project. I think 27 nations, European nations, are member of this uh, project, um, being chaired by the Netherlands. Um, and uh, there's also uh, progress to be considered. The question now is um, how do all those uh, developments which are considered in this project um, refer to or, or fit into these regional plannings and uh, that all the uh, efforts it's taken on the European side do not hamper or are in a, in a different direction, focus in a different direction than the NATO planning. Um, there are political limitations with regard to uh, exchange of, uh, of information between two organizations, EU and NATO. We have to consider that. Um, we cannot, due to um, members being not part of EU or not uh, being part of, of NATO, simply exchange and, and provide the EU NATO plans and vice versa. That is not possible. But, and that is where we are currently working on, um, to, uh, we have um, the authority to liaise directly with the European Union, the PESCO project, and we also speak with the individual uh, European nations 
in order to uh, align uh, all the efforts in a way so that the support of the PESCO project um, is also um, something which fits into the operational planning procedure so that we cooperate and coordinate. I don't know whether that's the right terminology, but at least not hampering each other, but aligning um, those efforts. That is where we are currently working on, and we are making progress in this regard. This question comes out of some of our Transportation Academy sessions. Um, it deals with um, struggles with sea lifts, but, but really the question is asking, so what's the coordination between the United States and, and allies and partners when the U.S. has shortcomings and someone needs to fill in the gap? How does that process work and how do those conversations occur to make sure that, that we have the full capability as we go um, into conflict together? Uh, you know, for a lot of those discussions are and should be going on in the geographic, geographic combatant command, so Indo-Pacific command, Central command, others. From the joint staff perspective, you know, we are looking across, much like Transcom, about our allies and partners and, and capabilities. And so there's various forms, you know, with Five Eye partners, as I mentioned, with, with other, you know, with NATO and how, you know, collective logistics uh, piece. But some of it becomes, you know, understanding what capabilities they have, and then the, you know, having that discussion, that plan, should be able to do it. But the, you know, whether sea lift or airlift, and there's already organizations like that for, and definitely for airlift in in Europe, where there's almost a, a timeshare, you know, trading kind of the um, <coughs> movement coordination center in, in Eindhoven. So, so yes, yeah, those conversations are happening. But I, I think even more so, we need to, as, as, as we said, we, we need to rely on our partners and bring them in, make sure they're involved with the plan early on you know, to understand that capability. A, a, a point that we are working now, not just whether we can use the transportation piece, but also the maintenance, repair, and overhaul. And so an effort I've been working with uh, Office of Secretary of Defense, uh, Assistant Secretary of the Defense for Sustainment, Sustain, uh, Chris Lohman, is on a regional or you know, a strategic plan, but looking at regional maintenance, repair, and overhaul locations. Australia, Japan, Europe, other places. The idea is if you have ship repair, you have a fighter plane or another plane that, that needs repairs, to think that in, in a contingency or crisis, you're gonna have to fly that thing or ship it all the way back, there's just not time. How do we have that capacity with allies and partners? How do we build that capacity that it's there that we're using it all the time and that has that, ex which allows that excess capacity in actual crisis to be able to, to surge to be able to do that. And this is from any kind of equipment other material repair, which is, it was part of that, because it's, um, it was, it was, we need to think through, because it's not just having that ship go, but it's in a sustained kind of conflict or protracted, you know, crisis, how we fix and sustain and do that to include, you know, technologies, things like advanced manufacturing and others where we can actually print parts instead of having to ship them, because to be able to ship them, we just don't have the airlift or not able to because of the contested environment or other priorities. Uh, that's a, a complex um, topic in, in crisis and conflict in order to uh, really um, set the, st the stage in a way that, um, for example, division uh, can be moved across an ocean into the theater and then be moved um, uh, on land lines of communication to uh, the location where required. And for this purpose, um, the interaction, the liaison, uh, the interaction between uh, the involved nations First, second, um, the interaction with the responsible uh, commanders, joint level, joint force commanders, and also the theater uh, co component commanders, land, air, and, and maritime. All are, all are involved in this complex movements or have to be involved. Otherwise, uh, this operation will not work. And this interaction has to be pre-planned and uh, the, the stage for that is, has to be set. Therefore, the interaction on liaison elements, exchange of that, and, and having established a close network um, is of, of high importance. And um, so that this complex operation in regard uh, of a, of, with a very short time frame uh, available, 10 days and so, 
uh, can be successfully conducted. A lot of preparation uh, has to be done, and this liaison ex exchange of plans, this common understanding is, is, is really important in order to support uh, Leo, what you've just said. And hey, Leo, uh, can I certainly please in inject here a little bit? Um, as I sit in the audience and, and I look, and based on my experience and my experience in NATO and with DSEA and with industry and whatnot, it, it dawn, it, things have changed over the last 10 years. And um, I, gu I guess I would ask, you know, in Na from NATO's perspective, what's changed? From DSC's, DSCA's perspective, what has changed? You know, in the, and I, and I, in change, I, I, by change, I mean progress. I, we've elevated our warfighting capability. What has changed for you, Jans, in cargo and your ability to move around? I, my sense is that things have changed and we're on a better footing. I know it's, I'll, I'll let the general answer, but, you know, NATO has, they're on a war footing now, whereas before we didn't even have plans. We weren't allowed to plan and cooperate with nations. So can you talk about that a little bit? And then DSCA, you know, things used to take years to do something. I, I know darn well it's probably changed, you know. So, and Jans, you, you might have a few comments as well. So. General first. Yeah, um, thank you for the question because um, that is, and, and what you just mentioned, I think that is exactly um, the trigger also for change because we have, we have plans. Um, and we are, when I say we have plans, that is right and wrong at the same time because that is a process, uh, iterative process. We mentioned regional plans, three joint operations areas, Atlantic um, being commanded from uh, Norfolk, Joint Force Command Northwest, southern area in Medi Mediterranean and uh, the northern bands in, in uh, northern Africa, um, plan being made uh, in Joint Force Command Naples, and center, Central European region um, responsibly uh, drafted by Joint Force Command Brunsum. Those three joint operational areas um, have their plan how to react, how exactly to deter and defend NATO allied terri territory. And in order to deter successfully, it is of utmost importance that all the preconditions are really there. It has a lot to do with credibility, yeah, this deterrence. If we are not prepared, and therefore we have to put this focus on peacetime, on now that we create the condition for credible defense. And that means we have to do everything in order to make those plans executable. And that is a lot of work still, still to, be, to be done. And I think and with regard to that, this question, this list of what has to be done is currently in development. And we have a clear, uh, a very good, let's say, uh, understanding of what has to be done. That's a long, very long list. And that focuses all the efforts on um, credibility with regard to executability of the plan. Thanks. Thank you. So, so I'd say four things. One, scale. When, uh, when Jim Hirsch, the current director of DSCA, came as an action officer years ago, we were doing about three billion, sorry, six billion dollars in government to government arms transfers, not including di uh, direct commercial sales. Uh, we've been averaging somewhere in the 48 to 50 billion dollars over the last few years, and numbers haven't been released yet, but it will be significantly higher. Um, and that's just overall, and then scale within speed, which is the next thing, speed. The amount of time that we have to turn things and provide the, the imperative to get things into the hands of Taiwan and other folks quickly, whether it be the munitions today in Ukraine and, and things like that, or, or at least a shorter time for places like Taiwan. Intent. Um, it used to be we did arms transfers for uh, overflight. We just, it was a political objective. And we really focused in the last years about, you no know, partners actually need capabilities. And we've learned what happens when we don't actually get them the capabilities that they need, the capabilities that they can absorb, apply, and sustain. Um, it's a lesson learned from Afghanistan and Iraq and places like that, but it's just as important when we talk about uh, other allies and partners that are out there. And finally, focus. 
you know, as the DSCA, I'll be honest, I transitioned from OSC policy to DSCA with the idea that maybe I'd get out of the secretary's line of sight um, on a regular basis. Boy, that was a poor decision on my part. Um, really, this focus on allies and partners in the last two national defense strategies um, is, is really a sea change, and, and I think that it's only going to grow in the intent and focus. Well, with all that equipment flowing around, we have a lot of companies willing to move it. Uh, it <laughs> yeah. I will keep it short. I think what's changed over the years is the cooperation, is, is the, ma the maturing of the cooperation, the communication, the way we get to work closer, the way we open up to each other better, get involved. We are not there yet. I think we still can do much better, but that's what being in this role, but also different roles in this community, and I think that really changed over the years, that, that it really matured, and it can still be better, but I think that's uh, we're on the right track there. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank our panel. Let me real quick. Now, um, you know, I, like I said, I've seen things change. In NATO, uh, a lot has changed. The war footing uh, has uh, really uh, become more operational. You know, it, before it was just a, like the general said, we, we would talk about it, but now he's in the middle of implementing it, and I, I'm really pleased to see that. Um, Let's see, right now we are gonna head off for, uh, for lunch and, and uh, excuse me,